Good afternoon. I would like to call the meeting for Historic Preservation Board to order. If we could please have a roll call. District 1. Is absent. District 2. Absent. Elena. Elena <laughs> Handel, District 3. District four. Denise Baum Dixon, District Four. Thank you. District five. Gary Bond, District Five. And Claire Willenberg, District Six. And Mayor Appointee. Bruce Rowley. Thank you. And could we have an approval of the agenda? Rally seconds. It has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Is there any new correspondence? Moving on. Uh, approval of the October 10th minutes. Oh, no, Are there any comments about the agenda from October 10th? Is there a motion to approve? Angle move to approve the October 10th agenda minutes as presented to us. Rally seconds. Been moved and seconded. All in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. 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 It is unanimous, so we will move on. Uh, we'd like to welcome all the guests and, and other staff support. Uh, is there any public comment? Seeing none, any unfinished business pop up since the agenda? Thank you. So we have a discussion of a letter to Wichita City Council or of PUD 2022-00018. Good, good afternoon, folks. I want you to know I was able to figure this out. And we have just been joined by Bob Potter. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is Christina Reith, Associate Planner with the Planning Department. And um, let's see if I can move the... Uh... Okay, and this is a discussion on uh, PUD 2022-00018. So, um, what we are voting on today is whether the zoning change um, from B multifamily to PUD 
um, is, uh, will affect the historic integrity of the two historic structures that are within this PUD. So just a bit of a background here, the applicant is requesting to amend the Vassar Apartments of Plan Unit Development number 78 to expand the area within the PUD boundary in order to develop multifamily residential uses multifamily residential uses and a limited number of commercial uses with co custom development standards on abutting and adjacent properties within one block to the north, west, south of the current PUD. So the proposed expansion includes properties at the following locations on the east side of North Holyoke Avenue, north of 16th Street, so that's 1704 through 1708 North Holyoke, on the east and west sides of North Fairmount Avenue, north and south of East 16th Street North, and on the west side of Vassar Avenue, north and south of East 16th Street North, as you can see in this aerial map here. So the proposed expanded PUD will create four parcels. Uh, the ones that we're gonna talk about today are only parcels one and two, because they are the only ones that affect historic properties. So parcel one is located north of East 16th Street between North Fasser and North Fairmont Avenues. And parcel two is located north of East 16th Street between North Fairmont and North Holyoke Avenues. So, um, just a bit of a background here on what they're proposing for um, height, density, and setback standards. So the proposed um, maximum height on parcel one is gonna be 55 feet or four stories. Um, the existing PUD uh, proposes 38 feet, but in B multifamily zoning, which is what it's currently zoned, they allow um, up to 55 feet. And then for parcel two, um, same thing, 55 feet, maximum density, is going to be 82.5 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the current PUD allows 73.5 dwelling units per acre and B multifamily zoning allows 75 dwelling units per acre. On parcel two, they're gonna allow the same as B multifamily zoning, which is 75 dwelling units per acre. And the front setbacks, um, they're for parcel one and parcel two are gonna be zero feet. This differs from multifamily zoning in that it allows um, a 20 foot setback um, and then the rear setback is going to be five feet as opposed to um, 15 feet. And then the interior side setback is going to be five feet, which is already permitted in B multifamily zoning. And then um, zero street side setback for parcels one and two, where they normally allows up to five feet for the interior uh, street side setback. Um, just skipping ahead here, because I know you guys have read the report. Um, LED and or electronic messaging signs are prohibited on all, all parcels unless they um, are approved an amendment to the PUD, not an administrative adjustment, but an amendment to the PUD. And so what they're proposing on some of these parcels um, for parcel one, um, which is uh, this Northern parcel here, um, group residence general, um, maybe a commercial parking area and short-term rental, which I believe Brian has already defined, but we can explain that a little bit more later. Proposed parcel two, which is on the, um, which is on the left side here, uh, they're allowing a group res or they're requesting group residence, commercial parking area, short-term rental, bed and breakfast in, broadcast and recording studio, uh, office general, and then personal care and personal improvement services. Um, however, staff does not recommend permitting personal care, per, uh, personal care services on parcel two. Uh, parcel two should act as a buffer zone stepping down to the intensity of uses. Uh, there's gonna be uh, screening and landscaping, uh, screening of trash receptacles as to reasonably hide them from the ground level view is required with either fencing or landscaping. There's gonna be a reduction in parking. Um, it says, um, the largest reduction would be a ratio of 0.8 parking spaces per dwelling unit. And um, parcels one, two, or three, and three are required to share complementary architecture with the existing multifamily structures within PUD 78. Um, within the proposed expanded boundaries of the PUD are two, res uh, two residential structures that are listed on historic residential or res registers. Uh, the Fairmount Cottage, let's see if I can pull up a picture here. Oh, 
here it is. Uh, so the Fairmount Cottage is the one in the middle here, um, is listed on the state and national uh, registers of historic, art, uh, historic places and is a good example of Queen Anne architecture. And then the Holyoke Cottage, Oops, I think I missed a, may have missed it here. I think I forgot to include, I, I'm so sorry, I forgot to include a photo of the, um, see if I can find it. Well, this is the Fairmount Cottage and this isn't the Holyoke Cottage. No, this is a different structure. Um, but the Holyoke Cottage is an ex excellent example of the free classic subtype of Queen Anne style of architecture. Uh, the applicant would like to use or uh, include the historic houses within the overall plan of redevelopment by use, utilizing them for residential and or small scale office and commercial uses as outlined in the PUD for parcel two. So um, just as some context, as you can see by some of the photos here, the area surrounding the site has a mix of residential densities um, from single family to multifamily. Um, however, most of them are uh, zoned uh, B multifamily residential or LC limited commercial district. Um, and then just some case history here, the Fairmount Cottage that we saw earlier, um, that's been on the National Register of Historic Places since 1985. And then um, the Holyoke Cottage was listed on the National Register in 2007. So um, based on the information available at the time of the public hearing, staff recommends approval of the PUD amendment for parcels one and two. And with that, I will open up for questions. Are there any questions or comments from the board? What <clears throat> you mentioned group residential? Yes. Does that mean just duplexes and apartments or what is group residential? So it's kind of like a, it's like an assisted living, or maybe Philip can explain it more, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is Philip Ziebenberg the planning staff. Uh, group residence general, is the best example in this area would be like a fraternity or sorority house. It's a, it's a residence that allows unrelated uh, individuals and group residence general allows it for 15 individuals or greater. Uh, we do have a group residence limited in our zoning code, which is up to 15 individuals. Group residence general is 15 individuals or, or greater. Um, so an example of that would be a fraternity or sorority house or really just kind of a group living environment. Um, B multifamily residential already allows groups residents limited. So what they're asking for that already is not in the existing zoning is allow for the possibility of a larger group resident situation. The, um, like a, a four bedroom, uh, like a four unit complex. How many it, units would be in each? It, it really just depends on how many individuals. And I, I think they're just opening up that as an opportunity. My understanding is their primary focus is multifamily development, um, where you would have individual apartment units, which would not coincide with a group residence. Like a group residence, a good example, if we... There's one in the packet here. Right. That's, that's adjacent, the Delta Upsilon house. Correct. So in a sense, they're looking to have the opportunity to have something like this, where the, like a group residence like this, it has like a common living area and in individual bedrooms versus an apartment building, each individual dwelling unit within the structure has its own living and bedroom area. Is this for college students? Is that the reason they're building these? My understanding is the primary focus is for um, housing individuals who would likely go to Wichita State University it is not primarily student housing to where it's restricted to students. Um, but they're definitely capitalizing on being near the university and providing additional housing options near the university. We do have the agent um, representing the applicant, and he can answer some specific questions about the development. So the reason we're hearing this is because of the two buildings, the two houses that are on that property. Correct. Not necessarily the area. Correct. It's those two particular mm -hmm. buildings. And, and they're going to keep those, right? Yes. They want to incorporate them into their overall development plan. Today's meeting is not necessarily discussing changes to those specific buildings. It's whether or not what 
could the new zoning allow and whether that those have detrimental impacts, possible detrimental impacts on the historic structures themselves. So, so the historic Holyoke is part of parcel two. It's not clear, is, is Fairmount part of parcel one or is it adjacent? Both historic structures are in parcel two. So parcel two, this is on MKEC saying, this is a Holyoke cottage here at the corner of 16th and Holyoke. And this is the Fairmount cottage on Fairmount and they're both within parcel two. Parcel one is the L-shaped, parcel two is this block between Fairmount and Holyoke. So it looks like we have multifamily on both sides of these areas. So this would be uh, right. similar to that the neighborhood already has some of that in it. Currently it's multifamily zoning. They're looking to do similar multifamily zoning. They're just looking for customs um, zoning classification that would allow the buildings to be built closer to the street. Um, and by owning, and this is something they could do today as well, um, by owning the same properties as the um, historic structures. Let me get back up to our map here. So the, the applicant owns every property within this block. Um, they're able to build across the property lines because it's under common ownership and it's under common zoning. And so um, that's something they can do today as well, but something to consider is by building across the property line, potentially, if that's an option, if that's what they want to do, you know, what what do these building custom these custom um, development standards have an effect? Do they have an effect, and what effect could they have on the historic properties here? And here, knowing right now we have buildings that have different setback standards, and they're set back farther from the street. Um, could developing to the um, to the property line, how does that affect it? Um, again, we're not looking at the individual structures themselves or possible changes to those structures. Those will be a separate review at a different time. Um, but you know, when you're when they're looking at developing parcel two, do these new zoning standards possibly have a detrimental effect on the historic structures? Is the conversation for today? Just one last thing, Christina. You said that staff approved uh, this. Well, staff is, um, so the Metropolitan Area Planning Department staff is recommending approval for parcels one and two. Um, well, the one in question is parcel two because it has the historic structures on it. Um, and this was approved by the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission on November 3rd. And as well as the, it was also approved on the DAB parcels one and two. Um, parcels three and four were denied by MAPC and by DAB, um, but those aren't, those don't pertain to our historic structures. And I'll just note that this is going on to city council. Um, city council has the final say on zoning changes. That's where this conversation has the right timing is that any um, conversation or recommendation from this board today will be passed along to city council as they look to make a final determination uh, on the zoning matter. I'm confused by what has been talked about the parcels. I thought at the MAPC, the historic um, houses were in three and four. No. No, three and four are south of 16th Street. This is parcel three. This is, or I'm sorry, this is parcel three. This is parcel four. This is parcel two, and the Fairmont Cottage is here, and the Holyoke Cottage is here. They've always been part of parcel two. Well, I'm confused. I thought parcel three and four were were denied because of the because of the uh, historic house. No, the recommendation from staff, in which what it was adopted by the planning commission as well as the district advisory board, was that the in requested intensity of uses south of 16th Street did not follow or conform to the uh, proper planning principles of stepping down the uh, intensity of uses. The block between 16th and 17th Street north of it has been the one under transition to a much higher density uh, level of development. Everything south of 16th Street, except for this area right here, which has the old place of worship, which had a daycare in it. Everything south of 16th Street is zoned two family residential and built with single family or two family homes, except for this structure here, which was an old place of worship. You do have the historic church here, but it's a much more contiguous zoning and contiguous type of development south of 16th Street. There's always been a line 
drawn where all the redevelopment is happening north of 16th Street, and this would be the first introduction south of 16th Street. Um, and staff didn't want to open up that door. And the Planning Commission and the District Advisory Board followed staff recommendation by denying the development south of 16th Street. It all makes all it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it's nice to see the planning in terms of the difference when you get below 16th. That makes a lot of sense from a historic standpoint. I think it's great that the developer recognizes those structures. Clearly, those structures not getting a lot of love within the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and whenever we have the opportunity to see investment that goes into an area that also respects those and has the ability to then bring economics to that area that can then help support those historic structures rather than watching them return to the earth slowly year by year. Um, I think that's a great thing. Well, I think at this time, it would probably be best to hear from the agent, um, have them have him tell you their side of what they're um, anticipating to do with this entire development and how um, they potentially plan to include the historic structures. Again, this is not a review on the actual possible physical changes to those structures. Those have to be a separate, um, in a sense, application, a separate review by this board. Um, this board is literally just looking at the overall development standards of the new zoning. Good afternoon, Chairman Potter and the Historic Preservation Board. Uh, Brian Lindeback, MKEC Engineering, 411 North Web Road on behalf of the owner and applicant. Um, just to give you a quick presentation, um, this is our what we presented to the DAB. Um, I think you guys know the parameters here. These are the, the black boxes are what we had included in the application. The orange circles are the uh, existing and uh, historic properties. Uh, just to add that our client does own uh, the, the Granada building uh, that he's uh, made some significant investments in and, and uh, brought that online. Um, certainly these two buildings uh, that we're talking about are subject of our conversation, um, have not been brought up to the standards that, that uh, we all would probably like to see. Um, he does have plans to, to do that. And um, one of these plans, uh, I'm gonna show you a concept of some ideas uh, um, that have been put forth um, uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Uh, John Clawfelter with Hutton. He's, uh, he's here with us today. So if there's any specific questions, um, I would just add that our client is, is, has uh, voluntarily decided to pull three and four out of the subject, you know, property. And so we don't have any desire to, uh, to do anything with those at this time. Um, probably just for um, good, good uh, explanation, back on the 29th, we had a, a neighborhood meeting uh, with all the folks on the ownership list. We met in the park at, uh, at in the neighborhood and then just went over some of the ideas and some of the the concerns that the neighbors might have. And so we have we did a, that voluntary neighborhood meeting um, for about an hour and a half or two. Um, I don't know that it's relevant to maybe go through all the, the uh, golden rules, but um, I think the premise of this is uh, there's been significant planning in, in this area and uh, for multifamily residential, of course, the pro property that we are uh, rezoning is developed uh, and planned for multi-residential zoning as it is it's be multifamily. Uh, we were just asking to make some changes to that and the, those changes were primarily centered around building setbacks and parking reductions um, and then um, some other incidental things that uh, are part of that. Um, the comp plan shows this area is um, ripe for new development. This is the area right here. And uh, this hatch pattern is on the north edge uh, of, of the area, and that is uh, for new employment and residents. And then this more tan color is for new residents. Um, 
uh, transportation is a big part of this, given the fact that we're asking for parking reduction. Um, this property does have um, good access to um, both WSU's transportation system, which is, um, I think, managed by the uh, city of Wichita Transit. It also has uh, good access to uh, the rest of the city. So that's an important part of this. This is the current bus route um, on campus. Just again, just to give you some background, these are um, parking stalls, different parking lots um, that the students have access to and faculty and um, different reserve parking. So just again, a robust parking operation nearby. Um, it's probably in the best map to look at it's without seeing it in person. It's kind of hard to get grasp the detail, but this, you know, with the cross hatch of the yellow and the green of student and um, faculty, the yellow is uh, faculty, staff, and visitors. Um, the blue is open parking, which there's not a whole lot of. Uh, and uh, you know, the red is reserve parking, and the pink is reserve clinic parking. So all this to show the, the green is, is strictly student. So there is some you know, st strictly student parking here nearby. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of parking stalls in the neighborhood as well as you go south of 17th Street. And this is just some comp plan stuff as well, dealing with the bicycle master plan. We'll skip through those. It's just kind of showing that there's been some advanced planning done there as well for uh, making sure that folks that are on bicycles have good access to the roadways and uh, to get to and from their properties. Uh, this is, um, so let me take a step back. So I'm gonna go back to that first slide that showed the areas to so just this is parcel one, Oop. just so there's no confusion. This is parcel one here. There's the existing building. It's um, black and orange that's there. Uh, there's an existing building here. It's called Dewell. Uh, what the white building I just showed you is planned for this space. And then I'll, I'll get into parcel two after that. Let's go forward here. Oops, wrong way, sorry. Sure, don't click too fast. Okay, so here's the Fairmount Flats that they're proposing to put on that parcel I just talked about. This parcel one. Uh, there's another view of it. Um, as you can see, it has uh, shorter setbacks. That's to um, help with the density, but also to uh, keep that pedestrian feel going. Uh, so as you walk out of the building, you're right on the sidewalks and, and continue on. There's just another creative view from above showing that, uh, that separation from the, the walkway and the building. This is the overall site plan for that part of that parcel. This is um, kind of amenity space in the middle. Of, I think the plans for a fire pit and some you know, other access uh, to the back of the property. Uh, this is on parcel two. Uh, this is the existing uh, rend a rendering of the existing Fairmont um, and sorry, not Fairmont, this is Holyoke Cottage. And uh, this is some of the work that John has been putting together with um, the, the potential client, which is Storytime Village, as you can see. Um, they've, uh, so this is looking, oops, this is looking north this way. This would be looking um, east this way. This is showing some conceptual parking on, on the street. Um, but um, I, I think it's an attractive uh, look and I think it uh, would be a, a, a benefit to the neighborhood uh, from a um, co you know, cohesive and, and, and following in with this, these historic properties. So again, like, like I was saying, this is a concept. So it's, it's got some, some more legs to figure out some of the details. Um, that's, um, but some, certainly some of the steps in the process are, are looking at how, how the, the historic um, property would fit in with this. Um, uh, let's see here, I think I skipped a slide, maybe not. Uh, this is a, a detailed kind of look of the building. Um, inside they've, they've showed some um, different um, uses there, possibly cafe, and that certainly would need some more zoning actions. Uh, they've got a little playground, some classroom space, office space. Uh, this is the um, Fairmont house, and uh, the, the goal there is to utilize a, uh, that space for an artist uh, or author's living studio. 
Um, but of course we have all the other land uses that we could certainly do, but these are, this is one concept um, that kind of shows a little bit about that. I don't know, don't need, yeah, know that I need to go through these parcel three and four, but if, if you'd like, I can show you parcels three and four. But this is uh, one concept that I was talking about and I was looking for, I thought I had one more slide that had more of the overview, but um, it's maybe escaped from this <laughs> somehow. <laughs> so, but if you um, could see the vision for the area, that's, that's what we're looking for as far as vision. Um, but you know, with that, I think I can stand for any questions or if you'd like, to, I can grab John and you can answer your, or question him with any of the ideas that are posed here. You know, before we go too far, I, I think it would be good for us to get some guidance on exactly what we're discussing today so that we don't get too far ahead and don't miss the point of what exactly are we trying Zoning to do change. today. Yeah, so we're we're making a motion or eventually to whether to approve or deny this zone change based on how it affects the historic properties. I have a question just kind of side since you brought up that slide. Storytime Village, is that the nonprofit? It is a nonprofit, yes. So they will be maybe housing? There, there. there would have an opportunity for housing. There's also uh, more to this parcel that that doesn't have just the this facility on it. There's some existing units uh, with uh, multifamily units on this parcel towards the north. So there, you know, at this time, there aren't any plans to demo those, but certainly someday they'll be renewed as well. I think Bob has a question. He has his hand raised. I'm yeah, sorry. Just, just just a comment. Um, this is the, the third time I've heard this presentation. And I'd like to say I, I really am impressed with the vision that they have for this area. And in particular, and the things that I tried to focus on were the two historic properties. I really like the way that they're trying to include them into uh, all the work that they have planned. So I, my hat goes off to you. I thought your your presentation to, to the uh, Metropolitan Planning Board and as well as the DAB uh, was very good, very well received. And uh, just like to tell you, we appreciate you being here today, even though uh, really all we're concerned with is the two historic properties. It's really good to see exactly how they may blend in in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Potter. I would also just add if, if there's any specific guidance that you'd like to give John, um, you know, so that he can be more prepared so that when he does bring this project back through to you, um, I'm certain that he would gladly accept some comments or just some anecdotal type things that, uh, that you would like to see or some, some ideas that you have. I'd like to uh, echo Bob's comments. I think you've done a good job. I'm delighted that you're planning to save the two structures. I have two problems with the small details. I, I don't have a problem with the zoning change. I think it will um, coordinate well with the historic structures. And I, um, the property you mentioned, I don't know the name, the one at 1702 Fairmount, that, he, that Mr. Farha, Farha owns. He's done a great job of maintaining that property and restoring the inside. I've looked through the pictures. I have not been inside, but it is also on the residential resources of Wichita as a, in the National Register. So you have three properties, two that are more important, but, but three that are very important. Uh, my concern is the styling of the high rise you're putting around the corner. I don't think it fits the fabric of the neighborhood and in that way reflects back on the homes you are saving and putting in. I like the idea of what you're doing at the Storytime Village. Mm -hmm. I would like to suggest you consider modifying that the apartments to fit more in with that fabric. Yeah, I, I think it. I think this all is kind of, I appreciate those comments. I think it is a little bit subjective though, because we've got the existing black building there as well. So, I mean, 
Uh, there's certainly, um, you know, cohesiveness that is important. So right. appreciate those comments. You know, the new apartments are going to be so close to what you're saving and maintaining. And uh, that's one concern. The other concern, and I know you have a lot of information, you've done your research, is reducing the park, parking space ratio from 25 to 33% or vice versa. The requirements, that area is so congested now during the day. And I understand students walk, students bike, they also have a lot of cars. Yeah, I can maybe shed a little bit of light on that. Um, presently, the demand is like 50%, and that's been working with other developers in this area. Uh, so about their their actual parking that they've built is about 50% demand. You know, certainly there's some different times here that, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, well, I hate to say COVID, but yeah, COVID and other things of market conditions, but they're trying to hit a little bit above that. Uh, so they're at the 75 and 80% on, on this project uh, parking um, ratio, if you will. Um, and uh, they're doing that because they don't want to, you know, sell short the idea of parking um, because their residents would like to, to, to have parking. The ones that do, they want to make sure they have plenty of it. Um, I have talked, um, over the several years that I've been working on these zoning cases in this area with a little bit of the university, but then also the, some of the council and some, I think the planning is getting engaged now a little bit as well, but on the idea of some parking planning, um, you know, other, you know, campuses with universities have, um, I wouldn't say a more robust, but a more extensive parking plan where it goes into the neighborhoods where there are certain areas where you cannot park unless you have a permit. And my hope is that could happen for this area as well at some point in time. But presently there aren't um, you know, specific plans for that for on-street parking. And so when that does occur, it will certainly change the landscape as far as you know, maybe as many parking uh, activities going on. But certainly people just park here and just walk to campus and don't have to buy a permit um, for parking on campus. So that's, that's been a, you know, an issue I think over, over the years. It's not necessarily this project's issue, but certainly uh, an issue that needs to be checked into and resolved if it needs to be. And that is a large campus <laughs> for mm -hmm. hiking across. Plus a lot of the amenities students or other residents want are gonna be either downtown or far east or a ways. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you've done a good job overall. I appreciate it. Yeah. Did, was there anything else that came up in the neighborhood meeting, which I also, really am impressed you held that meeting mm -hmm. uh, probably the, some of the big things is on those parcels three and four they just echoed that they'd like those parcels to be developed um not in a, a bubble if you will but integrating in the architectures that are nearby um the different types of housing styles um of the neighborhood as opposed to some of the more urban style developments that we've been seeing so um we we actually applied that to the zoning case, but of course, like I said, we've, we've thrown that out and you know, we had, a, I'll just, since we're talking about it, we had a vision for um, sort of these type of housing units on there um, where you'd have the porches and things like that up, up close to uh, up close to the street um, and then have the parking in the rear. And uh, we've worked on some other projects um, where we've got this more urban style feel and I think it would have been a good transition but I don't think we're quite quite there yet um, with the with everything so last question so yeah. I understood you to say at this time you're not going to proceed with three and four no it's the we've we've thrown those out altogether uh, we're just going to focus on these uh, first two parcels one and two um, thank you very much are there other questions comments? Do we want members of the public to speak on this? I'm sorry, definitely. Just a minute, Gary, did you have a comment? Oh, okay, yes. Hi, uh, Jay Price, uh, Wichita State University, so 1845 Fairmount. Um, and just had a question, um, people have been asking about this. And so who is the owner? Who's the developer? Who are our, our, our partners to the South? We just want to make sure that uh, uh, who's, who all was involved. So thank you.
Yes, it's this, it's the same owners as many of the other units there, the Dwell. Um, it's it's Mark uh, P. Farha. He's uh, our direct contact. And then there's some other partners that he has on some of the properties as well. So it's same, same uh, property owners as, as several of the other properties in the area. And, and they do own quite a few other properties beyond this um, in this area, all the way over to Hillside. Oh, certainly. Lonnie Barnes, uh, 2924 North Terrace Drive in Wichita, Kansas. And then I also own property in this area here, but I, get, I, get, I guess one of my questions, I'll point here, that this parking that you have here on 16th, so, you know, it's two lanes, one direction each way here. So are you going to cut back into your property from the, from the curb to put these kind of parking or how's that, how's that going to work? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, the, for the, the, the short answer is it's a work in progress. So there'll be certainly some due diligence needs to happen with the city um, since it's a right away, there's be some things that we have to, you know, some spacing. John's probably done some spacing. He could probably answer some of these questions a little bit better than I, but if you we can grab him here. But I think the reality is, uh, you know, the, you know, the, this, these sort of details are, are shown concept, shown conceptually at this point, but certainly they'll, they'll be, um, hashed out and, and refined with certainly getting more, more city official approvals. Come on up here, John. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you can speak to some of that as well. And one of the reasons I asked John, <clears throat> and, uh, a while back when they were WSU was looking for developers to come around, there's several people that they put out their RFQ in here. Uh, one of the people said that uh, 16th Street, you go where it uh, comes down to Fairmount and this and Holyoke in here, they were talking about dead ending those streets mm -hmm. so that you didn't have access straight to 17th straight down Fairmount to those and same way with here. So is, is any, anything true to that rumor? That I, I don't know anything about that. Uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, my name is John Claude Felter. I'm with Haddon uh, 111 uh, North Sycamore. Um, the parking that I've shown here uh, as a diagonals on street uh, were simply a, an idea uh, because I wasn't quite sure uh, at the moment that I was doing the sketches and the concepts what the parking requirements are going to be in the area and specifically for Storytime Village. Um, I knew that there was um, some things happening and there might be a parking reduction. So I was just trying to create pathways and uh, opportunities for discussion for how to park Storytime once we understood what the parking count requirements were going to be specifically to them. So um, I haven't pursued anything further uh, with respect to that and uh, kind of waiting to see how the PUD was going to shake out. Yeah. I have one more thought uh, since Jay Price is here. Maybe all of you know, but Jay, could you tell us a little more about the history of Holyoke Cottage and its importance to Wichita State? And I would, it's a little ahead of time, but I'd like to encourage the developer to have some plaques and some information in Holyoke Cottage about how important it is to the founding of Wichita State. Wow, um, how many hours do you have? Uh, they, uh, Fairmount neighborhood, the Fairmount uh, uh, neighborhood really is uh, intertwined to the history of uh, Wichita State back when it was first envisioned as the Wichita Ladies College in 1887. Um, the two structures that we really are seeing here are part of the development of the 1880s. Um, Fairmount Cottage, again, a Proudfoot and Bird uh, structure when we're really talking about the, uh, the, the height of uh, the, the boom. Uh, Holyoke Cottage is actually a really fascinating one because that is the home of Joseph Parker, who's really the um, person who gets the Fairmount 
uh, college idea up and running. Um, later on, that home, uh, once he, he actually goes to Oklahoma after the land run, and then that becomes Holyoke Hall, which is the women's dorm on campus. And uh, so there's a real connection to uh, women's studies, to the, to the role of women on campus. The whole area um, was an ad, was next to the university, next to the college. And that's been part of our story right from the outset. In the 1960s and 70s, it was also a, a countercultural area too. So there's some uh, fond memories of older uh, uh, faculty, for example, and, and uh, students from that area. So I think it'd be great to build that conversation in. And I'd be thrilled to um, make some connections on that to make sure though that layer of, of it is, is there. Um, but you're yeah, absolutely right. There, there are so many different layers to it. Um, highly recommend, by the way, uh, uh, for uh, WSU Special Collections. Got to give a huge shout out to them. Uh, they have a lot of materials digitized, including the Parnassus, the uh, Sunflower, and so forth. So there are a lot of historic resources on this area, on this neighborhood. Um, and so it's really intertwined. So it's good to see that conversation happening. Thank you. Is, is there a motion that we make? I would entertain a motion to either accept or deny the motion for zone change. Uh, I will move to accept. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to accept the zoning change for PUD 2022-00018. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you guys. Okay, moving on. Do we want to discuss the letter? Uh, no, so I don't think we're going to send out a letter because we already moved to approve it. Perfect. Thank you. Wait, Philip has some has a comment. I'll just note it in my city council report for the zoning item that you guys considered the item on at today's meeting and that you recommended approval of the zoning and I'll put a couple points of what the discussion was. Thank you. All right, we move to consent agenda. All right, so the following um, were uh, approved administratively by staff. HPC 2022-00114 uh, at Henry's department store, which we've seen a lot of uh, changes from there. So they're gonna remove one boiler and replace it with three boilers. And that's at 124 South Broadway. Um, HPC 2022-00119 uh, at 117 North Mosley. Uh, they're replacing the uh, roof with uh, TPO. It's on a non-contributing building. Uh, this is also known as the Heroes Building. Um, HPC 2022-00120 uh, at 124 South Broadway. They're installing some uh, fire suppression and fire extinguishers there. Um, HPC 2022-00124 at 1320 North Topeka. They changed out the external AC and furnace. And then HPC 2022-00125 at 3750 East Douglas, the St. James Episcopal Church. They are only replacing the flat roof portion um, with TPO roof. Is there any discussion or questions? Bob, you have your hand raised? Yeah, just move to accept the consent agenda. Is there I'll a second? second? Seconded by Gary Bond. So we are moving to approve HPC 2022. 114, 119, 120, 124, and 125. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Oops. I move to project review, number All right. 110. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is HPC 2022 uh, The applicant is Sue Champ and the uh, agent is King Solar. They're requesting uh, to install solar panels on their property or on her property at 1700 North Park Place, which is 0.17 acres. Uh, the subject site is zoned TF3 to family residential and is developed with a single family residential dwelling. It's also a contributing building within the Park Place Fairview Historic District, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So the proposed, um, let me give you the aerial of where they're proposing to have the solar panels. I'm just gonna skip through some of these slides here. So it's gonna be on the uh, contributing garage, which is on the left here, and then on the non-contributing shed on the right, as well as um, the back of the property. Um, so just north or just, yeah, just north of this chimney here that you can see. So I tried to go as far back as I could to get as much as the roof as I could uh, for that picture. But let me see if I can pull up an aerial. Well, it speaks volumes that you have to go so far to even see where they're going to go. Yeah. Okay, so they are, oh, here's the aerial. And I'm going to, let me just move this here. So it looks like they have a little bit south of the chimney, but mostly north of the chimney. And then they have it on the non, or the contributing garage and the non-contributing shed. So uh, the, the proposed solar panels will be attached to a rail that's fastened to the roof of the house using QB2 quick bolt feet, which will screw directly into the rail's joists. The conduit for the panels for the main roof will enter through the house. Um, probably the conduit will probably run down here um, uh, in a solid deck conjunction box underneath the black panels and exit the house near the current electrical meter. And let me pull up a photo of that. Oops. So this is where the current electrical box is. So they're going to combine all of the, you know, electrical units there. Um, so the the conduit that runs from the non-contributing shed and the non -con or in the contributing garage will be trenched over to the meter. Um, because of the main structure side gable roof, the proposed solar panels will not be visible from North Park Place. However, because it's situated on a corner lot, they may be visible from East 16th Street North, which is still within the historic district. It is the staff's opinion that the location of the proposed solar panels does not diminish the integrity of the structure or historic district. So I'm just going to read off some of the paragraphs um, for the historic register, National Register of Historic Places nomination file for the Park Place Fairview Historic District. Uh, the district is located within the city limits of Wichita and is a collection of late 19th and early 20th century residential buildings. It's located approximately one mile north of downtown's commercial core and represents one of the few intact close in historic residential areas of Wichita. Although there are a variety of housing styles, types, and sizes located within the district, the majority of the houses date from the early 20th century. They range from one-story bungalows to large two-story residences. A uh, little blurb on 1700 Park Place. Uh, this two-story National Folk gable front and wing house has a mixture of design elements from the colonial re revival as well as a craftsman styles. It has a moderately pitched gable, gable roofs with overhanging eaves and exposed beams. The front porch set within the South L has a shed roof with exposed rafter tails. The porch columns are classically paired tapering round wood. wood. Wood windows are one over one double hung and are grouped in threes on the gable front wing. A north entry door has a simple shed awning with triangular knee brackets for support. There's a rear uh, one car contributing garage with gable roof, clabbered siding and wood garage door with uh, cross bracing. So on August 4th, 2004, the district was added to the National Register of Historic Places as a Park, Park Place Fairview Historic District. There are no zoning cases associated with this property. And based upon the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, staff recommends approval of the application. Standards 9 and 10 state that new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction will not destroy historic materials, features, and spatial relationships that characterize a property. New work will be differentiated from the old and will be compatible with the historic materials, features, 
say, size, scale, and proportion and massing to protect the integrity of the property and its environment. And then standard 10, new additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. And with that, I will stand for questions. Are there any questions from the board? Comments? Anyone from the audience? Do I hear a motion? Rowley moves to approve. Second. Uh, motion by Bruce Rowley, second by Gary Bond to approve. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Moving on. All right, I'm going to skip to uh, HPC 2022 00113. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, this is for the International Harvesters building in Old Town. The applicant requests to install a pole sign on a 0.56 platted acre property at 355 North Rock Island. The subject site is zoned LI, Limited Industrial District, and is developed with an apartment building. The building is individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places as an International Harvester Building and is located within the Old Town Overlay. The proposed sign will measure 10 feet, 10 and a half feet, and will sit 10 feet above the ground for a total height of 20 and a half feet. The sign will be 10 inches wide with a three inch deep channel capsules on both sides for a total width of 16 inches. Let's see if I can pull up um, what, the, uh, what they're proposing. Right. Let me see if I can minimize this. There we go. Just so you guys get an idea of what it's supposed to look like here. Um, the proposed sign is not in conformance with the architectural design guidelines for the, over, for the Old Town District. Uh, three of the guidelines state that no pole or monument sign should have an effective area greater than 32 square feet. And the proposed sign will have an effective area of 45 square feet. No pole mounted sign should excite should exceed 15 feet in height. And this is where there's a little bit of a nuance that you guys can <laughs> discuss with you know, the old time guidelines and signage. Um, but the proposed sign will measure a total height of 20 feet, six inches. And then the light, from the, uh, the light for a sign shall originate from an indirect source and the proposed sign will be internally illuminated. The proposed sign is also not in conformance with the Kansas State Historical Society's guidelines for signs in historic districts and on individually listed properties. The guidelines state, using new illuminated signs, inappropriately scaled designs and logos, signs that project over the sidewalk unless they were a characteristic feature of the historic building, or other types of signs that obscure, damage, or destroy remaining character-defining features of the historic building is not recommended. It is not indicated on the National Register of Historic Places nomination form for the International Harvester Building that a pole sign that projects over the sidewalk, such as this one, is a characteristic feature of the building. Uh, the painted sign on the east facade, which I can bring up here, is likely was likely its um, prominent form of advertising. Oh, so that's what it's supposed to look like that they submitted a rendering to us. So. This was probably its prominent form of advertising. Um, I'm just gonna go over the architectural description really quickly. Um, the International Harvester Building, located at the southwest corner of East uh, 3rd Street and Rock Island Avenue in Wichita, Kansas, is a four-story rectangular building constructed of reinforced concrete clad in red brick with a footprint that measures 120 feet by 140 feet. The building is seven bays wide on the north and south sides, and eight bays wide on the east and west sides, and contains a flat roof. Rows of windows are present on all of the building's four sides. The International Harvester Building was designed as a warehouse and office space to accommodate the display and sales of the International Harvester vehicles and machinery. The International Harvester Building is nominated to the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion A for its contribution to the industrial development of Wichita and under Criterion C as an excellent example of commercial architecture. And this building was, um, ground was broken for the International Harvester Building in the summer of 1910. 
based upon the guidelines for signs and historic districts and the architectural design guidelines for the old town district staff recommends denial of this application however um, should the board recommend approval staff recommends the following alternatives approve a flush mounted or monument sign of the same direction or of the same dimensions on one corner of the building approve a pole sign with the maximum height of 15 feet and a total area of 32 square feet or approve an alternative design proposed by a design review committee. And with that, I will stand for questions. Well, we also have, uh, we're supposed to have indirect source of lighting and that's got an internal. We need to, we need to ask. Well, it, it, it breaks basically every rule. I'm sorry. It breaks essentially every single guideline yeah. not just that one so yeah that's i i i mean the first thing that comes to mind for me is i don't understand why it's not mounted on the corner of the building the building has plenty of room for that it can be indirectly lit easily from the building at that point having it off to the side like that is i don't know why we, we we would enable we would even discuss it given that I mean I know we're going to discuss it but we would entertain it given that it's it seems so easily able to to do this within the existing guidelines. I've got a question for maybe the owners or whoever designed the sign. Did they read the criteria before they propose this because they're like Bert said that. They've violated all the rules before they before we even got to us. They weren't even close. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, first, Mary Wilson with George Lay Signs, ten sixteen North Waco. Um, no, would would be the answer. Um, the owner we discussed going on the building, and with the age of building and as large as the sign could be, if we were allowed, we're gonna to have to through bolt. And these are apartments and it brings up a lot of other issues. Um, so the, the, do I? Okay. We considered it, but it didn't seem as feasible as, where is? Oh, sorry, you can, you can also use this here. Are you talking about where it's proposed to be? Yes. At the very end. Okay. okay. There we go. Back there. So, number one, this wouldn't be over the sidewalk. It is, the landscape area is about 12 feet. So, this would be within the confines of the landscape area. And as far as I mean, the, the pole seemed sort of a natural because it looks like a light pole. And that can be seen in one of your presentations. There's a light pole that looks just like that. Yeah. Is there any time with this one here? Um, yes, I'm talking about looking like the building that you showed that had a light pole okay. in front of it. Oh, yeah, I, right here. So that was where we came, where we landed was something that would be visible. We're not trying to be visible. It's not like we're on Douglas. It's not like we're not trying to be visible. We're trying to be visible to the people that are walking through Old Town. And yes, that would give, you know, visibility up there. But the, the more of the purpose is to the people that are pedestrians going through Old Town, hey, you can live here. That's, that was the intent of the sign. And as far as design, um, do you like the design? Taking away lighting, everything else. Sure, I mean. I, it's attractive, I, but to me, it looks too modern. definitely too tall too big i mean certainly you attempted to go for a period look yeah um 
I don't necessarily have a problem with the sign size, especially if you imagine it on the building. It is, I'm very familiar with this area and it's a, it's a, it's a large building. So I do think that the building could accommodate a sign and I'd be willing to consider a sign that was larger than um, the guidelines spell out right now, simply because it's a very large building. Right. And so right. proportionally, I think it could handle a larger sign and a smaller sign might actually look ridiculous. Um, but I mean, sitting, and I understand the easy way to do it is this, it's definitely harder to through bolt it. I've done that, um, especially when you've got existing tenants there. But the fact that it's not that it's internally illuminated, that it sits out, it, it, it's just too, it, it sits way too far out from the guidelines as we've laid them out, as they're laid out today. And I know we're gonna discuss them further, but uh, this is this is pretty far out of bounds for okay. me. Well, and and I apologize. I We submitted this and um, I thought we were within and then found out that we weren't within any of the guidelines. So we talked about pulling it, but I, I wanted a chance to at least explain why we, we designed. The I mean, size I, is, like you said, with the building. It, I, I don't want to, I mean, you guys can fix it however you want. I mean, I, I'm just saying from my standpoint, I would even be willing to accept it. Like if you said, look, we're going to make it a pole sign, but we're going to basically butt it right up against the corner of the building so that visually, you know, you, it, it, it appears that way, but mm -hmm. it's not, you don't have to go through a through bolting procedure. Um, I mean, any kind of attempt to make it feel more like it, it, it should, I, I think that I'm willing to entertain that. I'm only speaking as one, one person up here. Are you saying not to go with the guidelines with the size and all? I think we, I think they ought to, to follow the guidelines for size and the, and the hot lighting. Well, lighting for sure. I don't think it's necessary to, to have it internally lit. Um, size wise, you know, it's so hard until you do a balloon test or you, or you do a rendering to really see what the proportion is. I mean, th those guidelines were based on, there's a lot of small, I just think that the size part of the guidelines is kind of weird. And I know we're going to get to that, but the buildings are so, they're so vastly different in size that, this you know, in some cases. This is a building, it is away from traffic, really. It is kind of on the edge. And, um, I would love to see a rendering before I voted on allowing a bigger size, this size, see the rendering. If you put, could you put the pole right next to the corner? Um, I would need to go look at it again. I, I, do you think there might be an area The the owner representative is here? Michelle Grady, 355 North Rock Island, the historic 1910 building. Um, that little building that you see there on the side where there's the concrete, I'm sorry, I'll just step here and point to it. This is the concrete where the drive goes down and this is a little clubhouse. There is where the actual building starts. Right. And that's the only reason why we bought back here. But we probably could get a pole up right on the front part of that that would actually go up that side. So that could be a possibility. But for that to work, it would be taller. I mean, it'd be way taller. It's just- It's, it's a really tall building. On that side. Am I right or wrong, Christina? The height is on a freestanding sign. It could be higher on the building. Yeah, there's, sorry, I gotta speak into the microphone here. Um, I'll have to look into the old town guidelines as to what's permitted on flush mounted um, for, or for flush mounting onto the building. Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. They did allow like banners across the top of a building. I mean, I think this is going to be, I'm glad we're looking at it today before we have this other discussion, because when it comes to size, I think it's ridiculous to have any kind of rigid size restriction 
in an area that has such a huge range of size of buildings. I mean, there are other signs that could be put on a small building that would fit within the size guideline, but look ridiculous and out of place. And I'm not sure if it was abutted, would it maybe then fall, we could say it fell into the square footage of the building compared to the size of the sign. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, we could, we could say that. I mean, it's still not going to be physically attached to the building, but I think if we're saying, look, the intent is is to make it look like it's attached to the building, even if it's not structurally attached there, then I, I certainly would be willing to apply that logic to it. Yeah. yeah, I think there's some good suggestions, and I would like to say thank you for coming to us for sure. suggestions. I, I, I'm somewhat embarrassed for submitting something that we knew was um, outside the guidelines, but um, I, I wanted to at least have an opportunity to explain why yes. we were trying to do And we love the opportunity and, to work with you. Well, and I appreciate that. Yes. Uh, I'm John Lay from George Lay Signs. I wanted to elaborate a little bit as far as the internal lighting. And I know that when the old town area was being initially being developed, there was a pushback against, we don't want any molded plastic or anything, anything like that. What we've proposed here, everything you see in black is going to be aluminum. Now, I guess aluminum isn't period appropriate. Steel that would be rusty would be period appropriate. But uh, the look of when I think back to old time theater marquees, they've, uh, the, before neon came around, there were little glass discs that they would have light bulbs behind and things like that. Those were internal, internally lighted. If I think of an old theater marquee, it would have a stainless steel frame uh, that the letters hung on and it would have glass panels uh, between those. So, and then probably in the earlier days had uh, incandescent bulbs behind them and then eventually would probably went to neon, fluorescent, and other materials. So I, I don't, I think the, idea that something being internally lighted is historically inappropriate, I, I, I question that. The other thing that we're trying to do here is when this lights up at night, only the things that are white will show up. The background all just disappears. Um, so I think there is a place where we're using a blend of materials uh, trying to minimize the additional light that's thrown off to just the lettering and just the design features on the sign. We're trying to mimic looks that were are period appropriate, but still use some modern modern materials. But the use of backlighting, you know, in the oldest days it was glass and not not plastic. Well, the plastic works a lot better, just like aluminum works better than a lot of steel on sign. So I would urge you to don't throw out, uh, yeah, don't throw out the idea because something has backlighting. We are minimizing the backlighting. It's not like a big yellow background with red lettering on it that the whole thing's lit. Uh, I th think we've, when you look at the amount of, as far as the area on the sign, probably the portion that's actually going to be lit might be 20% of the, of the surface area of the sign. And when we're accomplishing that, I think that the whole idea that internal lighting is inappropriate, uh, I think kind of falls, goes against what you're trying to accomplish because we're minimizing the amount of light that's, light that's, that's being emitted, so. We, well, have you bring up... our, we have to go by our guidelines, though. Okay. I'd like for you to, to try the, to work with it. But your timing is mm -hmm. um, impeccable because that is the next item on okay. here. And that's so why I it came certainly, to the meeting. It certainly brings up, a, you know, a lot of the things that you've brought up here are things that we're going to need to consider when we when we think about this. Mm -hmm. At the moment, Elena's yeah. right. I mean, we have, we, we're just looking at it the way that it's written today and saying, right. geez, 
across the board, it, it breaks those guidelines, but we're now going to relook at all those guidelines. So we'll see where that lands. And this is a great example for us to, to think about as we, as we look at those guidelines. Okay. Thank Bob you. Potter Thank has you. his hand raised. Bob. Yeah, I guess just a point. Um, I know that we had, we proposed a flush mounted sign. I, I'm glancing at the uh, design guidelines right now. The pole mounted signs are the only signs that have an area uh, requirement of the 32 square feet. When I look at the flush mounted and then the general requirements for signs, it says that it should be in scale with the facet of the building. So that kind of leaves it pretty wide open, I think, as to the size of the sign, if it is indeed uh, flush mounted. Make sense? Yep. Thank okay. you. Any other comments? Is this something we can defer and have more ideas brought to us? Yeah, we could we could defer it. I move that we defer this for the, another meeting and have have them bring back some further ideas that we could approve. There was, is that a move? Okay, I'll, I'll second that. Yeah. Moved by Elena, seconded by Gary to defer one one meeting. I, I guess I, I would speak, I would speak in opposition to that motion. Um, as Bruce pointed out, there's enough other elements of this that were uh, that we're not in compliance, that I really think that the, uh, the applicant should revisit the language in the design guidelines and bring us another application. That would be an alternative, uh, Christina, which would be easier on the applicant. So Bob, are you making a substitute motion? No, I was speaking against the motion. Against made. that motion, or we could have a substitute motion. Just a minute, let's have a discussion. Which is more appropriate, Jeff or Christina? To defer or to deny and have them return? The only thing I can think of, I mean, it's like two nickels or a dime in that process, but um, how long it might take the applicant, whether one meeting period is sufficient or not and it could be longer than that so if they if you wanted to have them resubmit a new application it would be subject to their availability and timing okay bob the applicant would prefer to have it deferred for one month okay i withdraw Thank you. Be the next meeting, whenever. The next meeting. Not per se a month, but the, whenever our next meeting date is. So the next meeting would be December 12th, I believe. Yeah, December 12th. All right, the motion on the floor is to defer discussion and voting on this application until the next December meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we pass. Thank you guys for coming in. Next on the agenda, discussion Old Town Guidelines and signage. All right, Bob, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, point of information, I apologize for being late to the meeting. I was trying to figure out how to get through our firewall down here in Mexico, and it took a little longer than I thought. So I apologize for being late, and thank you, Elena, for, for stepping up. Uh, point of information, I know that the motion I made at the previous meeting was not in the minutes. Was that discussed during the minute approval phase?
today? Uh, no, that wasn't. Uh, the, the minutes were approved as what well, as is. Okay, well, I had sent you two emails with objection to the fact that 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 uh, motion was not included in the minutes. Yeah, I can make that correction. Okay. Do, All we right. need, do we need to vote to approve the minutes as corrected? Yes. Could Bob, could you restate your motion? I had sent uh, Christine, and I'm sorry, I'm not really in a position here where I can where I can do that. I gave her that language via email earlier in the week, early last week. Was and that you, the motion to, to nope, form an ad hoc committee? Nope, it was not. Separate motion. The one that was made at the previous meeting. I believe Bruce may have seconded it. The motion basically was that a committee be formed by staff and by uh, stakeholders to review chapter three of the, of the uh, Old Town guidelines, specifically items. Okay, Bob, I didn't know that was made in the meeting. I thought that, that you wanted that motion brought up today. No, it's a separate deal, Elena. Before, at the last meeting, I made the motion that staff coordinate this review. Staff informed me that they really don't have the resources to do that right now, which is why I took it on. Got it. Christina, did you receive the language that I sent earlier last week? I'll be glad to resend it. And it should be in the recordings anyway. So I'm not sure how to proceed on this. So this is not a correction to the minutes. This is a this is a motion to to review chapter three of the old town guidelines. No, Christina, the original motion that was made a month ago was that staff and stakeholders review those sections. And it was and that motion was made seconded and voted on, and it was not included in these minutes. Okay, or in the agenda, you mean? No, I, I mean in these minutes. Okay. I'd recommend going back and reading the- uh, Bob, can we let this rest? We will go back and review the tape from the meeting. And then and the added said motion would be added to the minutes if it was left out. And yeah, added just, to the minutes- just so if everybody understands, out. That we're talking an apple and an orange. The original motion had to do with staff and stakeholders. The motion that I'm getting ready to make deals with the preservation board forming an ad hoc committee. It's not the same thing. Got it. Okay. Bob, I'm just looking at the email that you sent out on the 7th. Is that the motion that you're talking about? No. The one that you volunteered to help me on? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's no, that's the motion that I'm that I'm getting ready to make. And the reason I sent that out the seventh was because I knew I knew I was gonna be out of the country and may or may, may or may not be able to to uh, to, to attend the meeting. Okay, so what, what do we need to do then? Christina, you can go back and look at the tapes. Do I need to resend the language again? This is Jeff Anzan. I'd recommend we go back and listen to the tape. Very and good. Uh, That'd be whatever's great. on that tape is what it would control. It will amend the, uh, understand the distinction now between the two motions. And so we'll address that and uh, pertain to whether staff had an sufficient time to participate or not. And then we'll take, we're just about ready to take up the second pertaining to the ad hoc committee. Okay. So Bob, I think you wanna make a motion, is that right? That brings us up to today's agenda and the discussion on Old Town Guidelines. 
Um, last week, I sent out a, a motion that I plan to make today. I would like to use that language uh, that was sent out. And basically, it's for the Historic Preservation Board to form an ad hoc committee. The committee would consist of a couple folks from the from the uh, Preservation Board and a couple of stakeholders. The stakeholders, I think I'd referenced in my email to you folks, I'd visited with the Burks. I visited with the president of the Old Town Preservation uh, Committee. And then I had visited with a historian, uh, an active historian for the Old Town guidelines and wanted to review chapter three, items 76 and 77, as well as the um, Sedgwick County Code dealing with signs. And the review would be specific only to illumination of the signs. I didn't feel like we wanted to open the door to fixing every problem that, that, uh, that may exist. That is my motion. I hope that you have it there, can re review it. And I'm looking for a second. Bob, you said Sedgwick County sign code. You mean Wichita sign code, correct? Well, Wichita Sedgwick County Unified Zoning Code is where I got this. And that was in Article 3 of the Zoning District Standards. In fact, it's Article 3, Zoning District Standards, Item B, Base District Regulations. Uh, it goes on and on. But both of those documents would be reviewed and a recommendation would be made to this particular board on a potential amendment. I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned an, a historian, uh, which person would that be? I, I included that in my email and I'm sorry, I just can't get to it now without losing you guys. Let me. I was trying to look it up too. We have DJ and Dave Burke, Deborah Fraser, and Charlie Claycomb is that's, what we have down that's, that's it. Those are the folks. I have some questions maybe on seeing if we could find who worked on the design review to begin with in 2002, adding someone from there. And maybe, I don't know who you have, is Bruce going to be with you from the HPB? Yes. Uh, this is Matt Roth, can I make a comment? Sure. Please. Uh, Matt. Yeah, Matt Roth with Miracle Signs. Um, I was hoping to be there today, but I couldn't. Um, I know you all are talking about the lighting within the code. I think it would also be important to look at the size. I know it came up today on the sign that was going over in Old Town and also came up a few a month or two back when we uh, went through the same process. Um, there's a very gray area of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Um, I know the city, for example, at a percentage of the uh, building size. Um, there's nothing that breaks that down in the code for the old town. The other piece I would ask to consider is, uh, I know you mentioned some names of people um, to be on the committee. I think it would be extremely important uh, due to the fact that you're dealing with sign code in old town to also consider um, somebody uh, or uh, a company to, um, that, that has sign expertise. Um, because the materials that are used in the sign industry have changed a lot over the years. Um, certainly, if we're looking at uh, uh, his, historic signage, and uh, John Lay just spoke of this earlier, um, that signs are not made the same way that they were in the early 1900s. Yeah, the, the only um, pushback I have on that 
is I would like to keep this very specific um, rather than open the door for, for all the problems that, that we may have. And if this works, then we could potentially form a committee to, to overhaul the entire uh, code. But uh, I, I, the, the issues that we've had have been with illumination, not, not sign size. And I, I would prefer also to keep the committee workable, small. And then when we go to public comment, of course, um, send the proposed amendments to all the sign companies for input. But, but as, as a member of the preservation board, we've heard the same problems, you know, now on the fourth, the, the fourth meeting. And uh, I don't know, I was just trying to keep it small. And, and I totally I totally understand that. I think it'd be important to have the expertise of the sign industry to um, lean on for what materials can be used to give a look that um, the uh, board or the committee are looking for. Um, I, I, I would just uh, like to say that that'd be something to strongly consider. And I think just adding size on is not that much more, making it much more in depth um, because uh, size was brought up today on what the scale should be. It was also brought up uh, for the idea ranch sign that we uh, got approved, I believe at the last meeting. Um, there's just a very gray area on size uh, that makes it very subjective for a sign to get approved. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm only uh, one, one vote here. I'd like to hear the pleasure of the board with respect um, to the motion. Should we, go ahead. Right now, I don't believe we have a second for the motion. So for lack of second, it dies, but we'll come back to it, Bob. Could we have a little discussion? Got to ask for one before you declare it. Black. Okay, is there a ask. second to Bob's motion? I'm sorry, I've been corrected. No second, but I, th I am guessing from the discussion, we're all in favor of having an ad hoc committee of having representatives from Old Town is it possible that we could put this off until Mr. Potter is back with us and have a discussion between us, among us, of who all might be on the committee? And, yes, and the scope of the committee? Correct. Defer it and then I, my only recommendation is you keep it an odd number of people so you don't end up with a tie. <laughs> Okay, we could defer it. Uh, there is a recommendation from our legal consultant that we keep the committee at an odd number so we don't have a tie. That's a good suggestion. Any other comments? Uh, I would like to. Where are I? And uh, Elena is saying she'd like to put this, defer this until January. Elena, is there a reason? For us to talk about and think about in preparation for uh, any motion that we might want to make in January. I mean, what are we really, what are we, what are we hung up on here? There's, there's two issues, whether we should have the expertise of a sign, someone from the sign industry involved in it, um, and whether or not it should be limited to illumination or illumination and size. Those, uh, that and the, a little more on the composition of the committee, maybe. Three things. Is there a motion to delay this until the December meeting? Let's and continue. Tomorrow. Let's continue with the discussion. If we had a representative from the sign company, 
along with two members of the preservation board, along with folk stakeholders in Old Town, that, that you don't consider that an adequate uh, a committee? Well, before Pop, you didn't have the sign company. So oh, you're right, I didn't. I bet I, I'm that certainly was open to that. I, yeah. I yeah. mean, I would hate to let the. I just, I just hate the idea of punning this to January and then. Definitely I mean, not January. There's yeah. a lot of stuff that's going to get continue to come at us, and if we're really just talking about those those items, I mean, as Bob knows, I, I wrote him when he first sent this out and said, I think it would be helpful to have someone from the sign industry, mainly because I want to make sure to get the verbiage right. Like, I don't even know the technical description of some of these things. And I think it would be important to at least have somebody to help us with the, the language and, and a deeper understanding of, of the materials and, and, and what's not just what's here today, but what's coming that we're going to be looking at next year. Um, Cause it is really very fluid um, that industry right now. And then second, I think size certainly is something that that we can address. I mean, I think we're prepared for that, and and I I I would support that kind if ex, that kind of expansion to include someone from the industry and include size in the scope. I think if we go beyond size, then it really starts to balloon. But um, those are things I can get behind today in the in the interest of getting this moving. And I, I would propose to make an amendment to my motion or restate my motion Good. Um, to include elimination and size with the committee members that I had provided in the email. And if Mr. Lay would be agreeable to join our committee, include him. I'll second that motion. Been moved and seconded that we form an ad hoc committee with the members listed in our motion, adding a representative of the sign production industry to look at size and illumination guidelines in the old town overlay. Just a clarification, I'd make it five people then on the committee. Five people on the committee. Yeah. I did, just as a point of clarification, you said both Mr. and Mrs. Burke, and then you also said somebody from the Old Town District. So that's why I was having a little trouble coming up with the county. So if, unless you had Mr. and Mrs. Burke only have one, one vote. vote. Okay. Yeah, the Burks would only be one one vote. Thank you for, for uh, asking that. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about that too, because it really, the balance D with yeah. them with one vote is much better. DJ was actually the one that would be on the committee. Is everyone clear on the motion? If there is no question, I call for the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, six in favor and one opposed. Five and one. Five and one. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a presentation by Katrina Ringler. She is the Certified Local Government Coordinator for the Kansas State Historical Society, the State Historic Preservation Society. And she's here to talk to us about uh, the state preservation law and the Secretary of the Interior Standards. All right, here we go. You can just use either the keyboard here to go through the slides or the mouse. Perfect. Yeah. I'm always a little unsure if this would be better to be doing at the front or the end. I don't know if that's, if it's, you know, go ahead. 
If it was we, about signs, it would have been good before. <laughs> yeah. I can do a presentation on signs if you'd like me to. Yeah, we can change day. it today we to do a sign need that, um, obviously. I was on the Topeka Planning Commission, and um, I served on a committee. They completely rewrote their entire sign code. So, um, yeah, it's it's a fun job. If you Is that something we could get a copy of? Sure. Now, it's the city sign code. It's not the historic um, right. And I just wanted to double check, not everybody's out of the room now. Um, the, the old town guidelines, I'm not sure that the harvester is within that area. Is it? Yeah, it it's is? within the, it's right on the edge of the old town overlay. Okay. Because the map that's in the guidelines doesn't go up to third. It only goes to second. Well, that's why we have to redo that guidelines. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> If, if I downloaded the right thing. Okay. If, if we are making corrections, Katrina, yeah. we have the address. The what? Okay. So that may be something that needs to be updated is because the map doesn't match the text. There's a but lot it was of written updating. in 1998. Speaking says. of updating, we have the nomination for the Fairmount Congregational Church with the wrong address. Can okay. I just send you the correct address? Yes, Will that please. work? Thank yes, you. Please. Um, so yeah, that is something, you know, things like that. Um, so to start this off, the reason I'm here, one of the reasons I'm here, not only to give you guys um, a training presentation um, per the requirements of the Certified Local Government Program. Also, I met with Christina earlier today. Um, once every four years or so, we're supposed to, I'm supposed to go to each of the CLGs and do a little evaluation check-in. And so we did that earlier today. And one of the things I always recommend to my CLGs is that you go annually, every couple of years at least, and reread your local preservation ordinance and any design guidelines, because obviously things change, things get out of date. Um, there's areas that could be clarified so that it could be a little bit more user friendly for not only the public, but for you all when you're trying to make design decisions. So that would be, that's a good exercise that you guys are gonna undertake. Um, so I am presenting today um, a training for you all to fulfill your annual training under the Certified Local Government Program. Um, I probably haven't done that in a while. So if you guys have questions or wanna discuss anything as we go along, feel free to just holler at me. Um, so just giving you guys a little bit of a preview, of course, you know this, that um, if you survive long enough, you're revered rather like an old building, Kate Hepburn said. Um, we are the only country in the world that trashes its old buildings too late. We realize how very much we need them, said Jackie Kennedy. And of course, Jane Jacobs, the famous planner, says in wretched outcomes, the devil is in the details. So that in a, in a, encapsulates, I think, design review. Um, as you guys have <laughs> tried to tease out today. Um, just a refresher, the Certified Local Government Program or CLG program, because the government loves acronyms, um, was established in the 1960s along with the National Register and the State Historic Preservation Office, Offices when the National Preservation Act was established. Um, the CLG program is just a partnership between the local government, the State Historic Preservation Office in the middle, and the National Park Service at the federal level. So it really is just the National Park Service saying, hey, you guys at the local level, you have a preservation program that meets certain criteria, and we're here to support you in that and offer any assistance we can, um, including money, which I'll talk about later. So the city of Wichita is actually our oldest CLG in the state. Um, it became certified in 1985. Um, this agreement um, between the city of Wichita and the SHPO is what establishes the CLG. It is not to be confused with something we'll talk about later, which is the state preservation law agreement. That's something different. This just says that the National Park Service has certified the agreement says that you guys meet the criteria, your local preservation com uh, commission and ordinance fit the bill and that you qualify for the, the program. To be a CLG, a couple of things that you have to have are you have to have a local preservation ordinance. Um, that ordinance has to establish a preservation commission, which is why you guys are here. 
Um, you have to maintain an active survey of local historic resources, establish a local landmark program, and participate in the National Register process. So when a property is nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, my office always notifies you all through the staff um, that a nomination is being heard and we would very much like any feedback you have on that. Other things that a CLG can do, they're not required to do, but you can do it, especially if your local preservation ordinance allows you to, is establish design guidelines. Hi. <laughs> um, do design review of local landmarks and local districts. Administrate a local incentive program of some type, um, a loan, a grant, a tax incentive, however your um, local government is willing to support those things. And then any other preservation related function or activity that's allowed by your ordinance. Um, some preservation commissions get very active in doing sort of outreach and education. Others are more regulatory and either, either is fine um, as long as your ordinance allows you to do that. So um, we, when we talk about design review, which is the main thrust of what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, there are a couple of things to clarify. Um, I find that a lot of CLGs, especially in Kansas, get confused because being special as we are in Kansas, we have a state preservation law, which most other states do not have. Um, most preservation in the rest of the country is done purely at the local level through a commission such as you all. And the state preservation office, my office, does reviews under federal preservation law. We administer tax credits. We administer the National Register Program. And we don't have anything to do with what you all are doing design review-wise at the local level. Kansas is special, so we'll talk about that and how we're special in a minute. But a COA, how many of y'all know what a COA is? Certificate of appropriateness, certificate of approval, however your local, well, Christina knows it because she has to read the ordinance all the time. So a COA or certificate of appropriateness or approval is what your local ordinance design review is called, okay? So if you say to someone, you need a COA for that, you're talking about a local review of a locally listed property. It is mandated by your local ordinance and it is only for locally designated buildings and districts, not state and national, local only. You use the standards that are adopted in your ordinance to do the design review. Usually those are the Secretary of the Interior standards, but not always. Sometimes they can be slightly different, but to be a CLG, they have to be compatible with the standards. So usually they're just the standards. A COA can and often is triggered by a permit or some sort of action by the local government, um, but not all ordinances say that. So you definitely want to read your local ordinance and see what it says. Um, some preservation ordinances say that all projects on local listed historic buildings have to be reviewed by the Preservation Commission. And I always ask you all, how do you know if I own a historic property and I don't and I don't have a permit requirement, how do I know I'm supposed to come to get a COA? So that's a question. Some CLGs have a local ordinance that also includes environs. Wichita obviously does not, but Kansas City does. Um, I think Salina. Um, the state preservation law used to have an environs clause and it does not anymore. So that is something um, that to just be aware of. Um, COAs can sometimes take into consideration financial or economic hardship. Um, that is something that a local preservation ordinance can include. So if yours does include that, basically it takes the place of a COA. What might happen would be in a regular design review, let's say, for example, you say replacement of these wood windows with vinyl is not appropriate. And if the applicant says, but I can't afford, you know, metal or wood windows, and here's the documentation, then you could issue a certificate of economic hardship. So if that is in your ordinance, that is something you can do. If it's not in your ordinance, it's not something you can do. Appeals under your local review process um, vary. 
A lot of times they go to the city council, um, but sometimes they will go to other boards like the planning commission. So just be aware of that. The state law, like I mentioned, is just for Kansas. It is something that is unique to us. Um, a couple other states do have state preservation laws that only hold the state and cities and counties accountable for um, review. Um, I think Kansas, to my knowledge, is the only one that goes down to the permit level. So we'll talk about that a little bit. The state statute, um, which I have there, lovely KSA 75-2724, say it in my sleep, um, says that properties that are listed in the state and the national register or within a state or national register listed historic district are subject to the, to the review. We have to use the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. Most of the time we use those standards for rehab. Um, it is triggered by an action of the state or a subdivision of the state, which means a city, a county, or a school district usually. But it also means that a permit issued by one of those entities triggers review. That means it also includes interior work. So if someone says to you, oh, it's just the exterior, that is not true if you're dealing with state law. I don't know what your local ordinance says, but the state law says it's triggered by an action of, of the government. So if that government is asking for a permit of an interior project, that also requires state law review. The threshold for review is we are looking to determine if the project will damage or destroy the listed property. We're going to use the Secretary of the Interior standards to determine that, but we are not approving or denying the project. So I was making notes over here on the staff report <laughs> because really what the motion should say if you're reviewing something under the state law is I move to approve this project or you can say I move to say that this does not damage or destroy the historic property. Um, having that language in there is a good idea. Um, it's also a very good idea to state up front which law you're reviewing the project under, because if it is listed on the local and the state and the National Register, then you're supposed to be doing two separate reviews and two separate motions. Appeal under the, under the state statute goes to the local governing body. So if you guys do deny, you find that something will damage or destroy historic property, the applicant can't proceed with the project. So the, the permit can't be issued. The city can't do the project. The county cannot undertake or fund the project unless the governing body has a meeting to determine if there's feasible and prudent alternatives to the project. And if there are plans that um, have been made to minimize harm to um, the historic property. If they move forward with that, um, and there are people in the community, um, parties that are aggrieved by their actions, they can file in court. So just a little bit of comparison here. COA, local ordinance, locally designated properties, things that are on the Wichita Landmark Register. State law, it's a state statute. It's for things that are on the state and the National Register. The COA, you're gonna use the standards that are in your local ordinance. They're probably the Secretary of the Interior Standards. For the state law, you have to use the Secretary of the Interior Standards. You can also use local guidelines as long as the SHPO has approved that and as long as they're in conformance with the standards. COAs are usually triggered by a permit, but not always, so double check that. Kansas state law is always triggered by an action of the government, so state, county, or city. Um, it does include interior work. The COA is usually written out to say we approve, approve the conditions or deny the SHPO or the Preservation Commission if you're doing a state law review, you're actually determining if the project will damage or destroy the historic property. And then of course, appeal to the local governing body or appeal through your local preservation ordinance, however it says. Um, and then consideration of financial impact on owners is a local thing only. Um, we cannot take into consideration financial or economics with a state law review. That's something that the governing body can take into consideration, 
but not the Preservation Commission or staff or pr the, the Preservation Office. So we have conducted an evaluation of the CLG program today. It's nothing too exciting, nothing bad. Um, a couple of things that we're gonna kind of communicate about and talk about, and I'm just gonna um, issue a letter with a couple of reminders. Um, but the next things on the agenda for you all, I would recommend is reviewing the local ordinance, reading through it, maybe you know at the end of the year, first of the year, January or something. Um, just to make sure you understand the different sections of it. Um, Christina was talking, it's like 44 pages long, so not like a light read, but <laughs> not a novel either. It'll be okay. Um, and then we are working to update um, the state law agreement um, with the SHPO. Um, it expired. I think, I think it was 2019. Yeah. Yeah. COVID kind of hit us. Yeah, we're not legal in compliance right now, but we're letting it ride for now. Um, I think by the end of the year, though, we need to get that signed because um, my supervisor will probably be wondering like why we don't have a signed agreement. Um, and then confirm that if there's any additional guidelines that need to be used as part of the review process that we have those on the books, um, even though the old town guidelines are apparently going to be updated, just making sure that we know which guidelines you guys are using for your reviews is a good idea. Um, we also want to confirm when we have those agreements between the city and the state, um, there is a provision in there that you can lay out what is a minor review for administrative um, approval versus a major review. And so it might be a good idea to look at that again too, just to make sure, you know, there's nothing on there that you want to change or update. So things like solar panels and stuff like that probably weren't something that was commonly coming across your desk, you know, 10 years ago. So, yeah. so we're going to talk about the Secretary of the Interior standards just to review and refresh. Um, you guys may be aware that the standards for the treatment of historic properties is sort of the big overarching umbrella that the National Park Service has. And then we have under that standards for preservation, restoration, reconstruction, and rehabilitation. Mostly we use the standards for rehabilitation, but the standards for preservation are things like where you basically would just hold it in a box as it is the way it is forever and ever. You're not going to try to improve it or adapt it for a new use. You're just preserving it as sort of a time capsule. If you're doing a restoration, you are actually removing the parts of the building that are from a later period or not from the period that you're trying to restore it back to. So if a president lived in that building and you wanna restore it back to when they lived there, then you would take away everything that is not from that time period. A reconstruction is obviously when an entire building or a major part of the building has been demolished or you know, taken away, um, and you're reconstructing it based on historic documentation. Um, this is a building that was damaged World War I or World War II, I'm not sure, um, and it kind of has a scar where you've obviously, you can see that it's been reconstructed. Um, all three of these are not really something that you or I deal with on a daily basis because we, we mostly deal with buildings that are still in use or are trying to get back to a new use. Um, these are things that mostly deal with museums, historic sites, tourism sites, those kind of things, because most people don't want to live in a pristine, preserved house. They want to live in a rehabilitated house. So rehabilitation is when you preserve the things, the characteristics and features of the building that make it historic, but you update the things that you need to make it usable for today. So you might put on a new addition, up to great electrical and plumbing, HVAC, that kind of thing. The first thing that we all should be doing when we are starting a design review pro um, process is to identify the character defining features in the integrity of the property. So just like today um, on a couple of the cases that came before you, Christina read out sort of the description of the property from the National Register nomination um, and just, you know, kind of highlighted the character defining features of those buildings. 
Um, and pretty much, you know, you guys have been doing this a while, you can look at a picture and can just kind of pick it out, right? So the building on the right in this example, character defining features are pretty, you know, pretty obvious and out there too. You've got the half timbering, you've got the massive um, chimney, masonry structure, um, you've got the, the big um, uh, hipped roof, um, two-story structure, the windows, multi-pane, all those kind of things just jump out at you. The building on the left, it would be harder to kind of quantify its character-defining features, right? Because it's kind of lacking some integrity. Um, it has siding on it. It's had obviously multiple additions. It's maybe missing some things. So if you're doing a design review on a building like on the right, it may actually be easier because you can kind of identify the character defining features pretty easily. The building on the left, if that's a non-contributor in a historic district and they want to put solar panels on the roof, okay, well, that may or may not affect this building, but will it impact the rest of the historic district? Because if that house on the right is next door, okay, now we have to kind of look at what's around it, even if the building itself is lacking in integrity. So going through the standards, there's 10 standards, as you may know. Um, the standard number one says that if you are going to rehab a historic building, hopefully you're going to rehab it for its historic purpose and use. But if not, you're going to have a new use that will require minimal change to the defining characteristics of the building. So again, the defining characteristics of the building have to be identified before you know what they are, right? Um, so when we're looking at downtown um, commercial buildings, which a lot of my examples today are going to be that because they're kind of easier to, to point out. And it's also easier to find bad examples sometimes. Um, you got a downtown commercial building, usually they have a storefront. And so if the new use is going to require infill of the, of the commercial storefront, that may not meet standard number one. It may not be a good use for that commercial property. By um, counterpoint, you may be able to find a creative way to address um, the need to enclose the storefront. So the building on the left that has the Budweiser sign, um, there was a local ordinance in that community that said that if it was a drinking establishment, it could not have transparent windows to the street. Um, and so obviously that is a original storefront on that building. We did not want them to modify it too significantly. Um, and the property owners just came up with, you know, okay, well, as long as the sign code allows it, we'll just put graphics in the windows and that way that addresses that issue. That's perfect. Standard number two says that when you have historic character of a property that it should be retained and preserved, removing historic materials, altering features and spaces that characterize a property should be avoided. So obviously this building had a bit of a issue. <laughs> um, it actually had a slip cover on it at one point and they cut off the top of the building to make the slip cover fit. Um, don't worry, there's a better picture later. It got, got preserved. Um, but I highlight here features and spaces because we're not always just dealing with the exteriors. We're also dealing with the interiors and spaces such as churches, schools, um, you know, other large gathering places, maybe a depot or something like that, where you have a large public space, that volume of space can also be character defining. So a project that we, you would, you know, cut that in, in half or subdivide it could have an adverse impact on the historic building. Standard number three talks about context of time. Each property should be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. So changes that create a false sense of historic development, like adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings should not be undertaken. Um, this is pretty typical. We see this in a lot of Kansas towns. <laughs> Our, my boss, Patrick, um, calls this Buckaroo Revival, um, where in like the mid 20th century and late 20th century, um, people tried to kind of make these downtown commercial buildings more old timey um, by adding sort of rough wood, barn wood, um, rustic shingles and things to them. 
um, they would have never had these kind of awnings on them. Um, and so that's, that's adding conjectural features that would have never existed on these buildings. By contrast, we also have other mid-century, actual mid-century modern buildings um, that of course have become historic in their own right. Um, built in the 40s and 50s and now up into the 60s and um, 70s. Um, 50 years ago is coming up on 1973, y'all. Um, so these would not have had fancy um, cornices or leaded glass windows or cast iron columns. They certainly wouldn't have had a wood shake awning, but they also wouldn't have had the candy stripe awning that's a lot of us come to know as sort of downtown Main Street type um, awnings. So um, looking at the building's character, you know, you guys were talking today about the sign on the International Harvester building, the size, scale, massing of those buildings comes into play as well. So most properties change over time. Those changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right should be retained and preserved. This is always an example I use in downtown Hutchinson, the Pegues department store, the big building there um, in the middle. Um, it was built in the 19 teens. It had an elaborate um, Beaux Arts kind of swag, lots of terracotta, like grape leaves and things on it. Um, 1950s, they wanted to modernize. So they scraped all that off and put a metal facade on it. They also completely remodeled the interior with, with stainless steel and pink and turquoise tile. It's 1950s. And so even though we have historic photos from the 19 teens to show what the building originally looked like, it was only in that condition for a couple of decades. It has been in this style and this configuration for most of its life. This is authentic. This is the real historic thing. If we were to go back and recreate that 19 teens facade, it would be fake, right? It would just be a recreation. Um, so we want to also always kind of take into consideration the changes that have happened over time and if those changes have gained significance. Um, so if something important happened here in the 1960s or, you know, that, that could be the historic period of a building versus even though it was built in the 19 teens. Um, and so this is my plug for the mid-century slipcovers that are becoming 50 years old. Um, we just listed downtown Great Bend as a historic district recently. And it's probably our first example of some 1960s and early 70s slipcovers where the buildings are treated as contributing to the historic district with the covers on them. Um, and removing the covers would actually make the buildings non-contributing because there's nothing behind it to show any other historic features, yeah. So if you, <laughs> I've been telling people this for a while and now it's come to fruition. If you don't like those, slip covers on your commercial buildings, you should take them off because they're gonna be historic. Standard number five says, again, it's kind of a, a play on the same theme, um, distinctive features, finishes, construction techniques, or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property should be preserved. And so there are resources that the National Park Service has to um, help us and guide us. Um, the preservation briefs are a great resource and preservation brief number 17 is all about architectural character and how to recognize it. Um, I always point out too that this standard talks about craftsmanship. So it could also be something that's not readily visible to just a casual observer. Um, for example, I've had projects before where they started doing preliminary demolition and found out that there was a log cabin inside of the house or a rail car, um, or that there was this very interesting masonry technique that was inside the walls, but you couldn't see it from the outside. Um, and so things like that, when you come across them, of course, should be preserved if, if at all possible. Standard number six is probably the big one that most people think of when they're talking about um, historic rehab projects. Of course, deteriorated historic features should be repaired rather than replaced, but we all know that severity of deterioration can make repair not possible in a lot of time, in a lot of cases. 
So when you have to replace something, um, the new feature should match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities. And then it says, where possible, materials. So materials is a secondary thing. But first, we have to determine that the historic feature is not repairable, and then we can talk about replacement. So again, windows is always kind of the thing. That's why I have it on the slide. People come and say, well, I need to replace my windows, and here's what I want to replace it with. Hold on. <laughs> First, we have to determine that the windows you have are, are they original? Are they historic? Or have they already been replaced? If they are original or historic to the, the significance of the building, are they beyond repair? And then we can talk about replacement and do the replacements match the historic um, in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities. Um, where you do have replacement things that you know something has already been replaced in the past and you want to replace it again with something better then it needs to be substantiated by documentation so some sort of physical or pictorial evidence um, i always bring up the examples if i have a little schoolhouse one room schoolhouse and it's really cute and i'd like to put a bell tower on it if i don't know for sure that the bell tower was a thing on this building you don't want to put that on there because that's conjectural, right? Unless I have a photo or a drawing or something showing me or telling me what that bell tower looked like, I'm adding conjectural features, which doesn't meet one of the previous standards. Yeah. So if there's a building and it has replacement windows on We could. Um, what we try to do is uh, la later on, and I think it's in one of the standards that Christina quoted earlier, nine and 10, they talk about compatible. So if you don't know what was their original, the replacements, you know, are not good. They're not compatible. You would not have approved them, you know, whenever they were replaced before. Um, you want to go back with something that's better. So you do try to look for something that's compatible. Um, and a lot of times that's, you just want to keep it kind of simple, like windows, you might just go for a one over one because that's just sort of the vanilla middle line. Um, you don't want to go with leaded glass or steel casements or something, not knowing what was there originally. So, yeah. But yeah, looking at other buildings is a good way to do that. So remember this building, obviously, the, re the restoration of the, um, the cornice and the, the gable points on the parapet um, was based on documentation. Not only did they have historic photos of the building, but also just from the physical evidence on the building, you could tell where the parapet used to be. So standard number seven calls for using the gentlest means possible. So whenever you're doing some sort of physical or chemical treatment to a property, um, and it mentions sandblasting outright, that causes damage to historic materials, don't do that. <laughs> You want to only clean structures when it's absolutely necessary. Um, and if, you, if it is necessary, make sure you use the gentlest means possible. Um, this, the preservation office, we only approve cleaning in two cases. One, if the, the dirt is causing harm to the historic building. So like it's actually you know acid eating into the stone or something. Or in the case of the Capitol building there on the bottom right, um, if they're going to be doing repairs and the stone needs to be clean so that they can do color matching and make the patches stick. Otherwise, it's better to just leave it. It's a hundred year old building. It's going to look old. Just leave it. <laughs> um, standard number eight talks about archaeology. It's not something we deal with a lot, but it is something that can kind of just sit in the back of your mind when you're doing design review. Um, significant archaeological resources affected by a project should be preserved and protected. If resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures should be undertaken. Um, we do have a state archaeologist. I know you guys also have a city archaeologist you work with at um, WSU. Um, so it's just something to kind of keep in mind that anytime there's a project that's going to disturb the ground, um, there is a potential that they would run into something that is a buried um, historic resource. 
um, and what what you know what you hit and what what you find often determines who you call. Um, if anybody finds bones, they're supposed to call the sheriff first. And then if the sheriff determines it's not a crime scene, then we can talk to an archeologist. I love getting that phone call. Found some bones. No. Oh. Um, so standards number nine and 10, um, as I mentioned, kind of go hand in hand. They both talk about new construction, additions, alterations. So if you're doing new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction, you do not destroy the historic materials that characterize the property. Again, that characterize the property comes into effect because if it's not a character defining feature, then that's where you want to make the changes is in the areas that are not character defining. Um, new work should be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing size scale and architectural features. That can be a hard line sometimes, especially for design professionals, um, because differentiated means different, compatible means sort of the same. So what does that mean? And it is hard sometimes to define that. Um, and it's hard for all of us as design reviewers to explain to someone why I know it when I see it. <laughs> and when they say, well, I wanna know what I can or can't do to my historic building, it's really hard to say because until we see it, we don't always know if it's gonna be compatible or not. Um, but I also like to point out, it says massing size, scale and architectural features. So especially when it comes to new construction, massing size and scale carries a lot of the load. Um, architectural features come into play but if you're in a downtown historic district or something like that, or even a neighborhood historic district and you have a new infill, um, the massing size scale setback are gonna do a lot of the work. And then the architectural features like the materials and what style it is kind of fall in line if you get the massing size and scale right. So this is just an example from Hutchinson where they have kept the original cast iron columns. Um, I was gonna go back. I mean, obviously the person that did this storefront remodel in probably the eighties was not trying to be compatible at all, right? It's differentiated, not compatible, but the new storefront is trying harder to be compatible. You've got a bulkhead display windows, a transom window, paired entry doors on the left. Um, even though the storefront on the right has been modified, there's still enough features there that they could kind of tell what the original probably looked like. And they also had historic photos. So within a downtown historic district or a neighborhood, again, if you have new construction or infill, you're looking for, is this compatible? Is it differentiated? Differentiated can often be something just as minor as materials, or size and shape of things. Um, I mean, I think if you had a down, if this was in downtown Wichita, what do you guys think? Would that be something that you would find compatible? Would it be differentiated enough to determine that, you know, nobody would think it was historic if they really looked at it hard? Yeah, <laughs> those are all new. <laughs> Uh, and then standard number 10 says that new additions adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the property and its environment would be unimpaired. So we kind of talk about this as the hyphen. Um, if you're doing a new addition to a, to a building, you wanna just touch it as minimally as possible. Um, a lot of times I use the um, Eaton Hotel as a good example of that because the new addition is just connected with a hyphen at the back. Um, also, going back to standard number nine, that new addition is compatible. You know, it's obviously tried to mimic some of the details of the Eaton, but in a much more simple sort of flattened way so that nobody's going to confuse it to be an actual, you know, 1880s, 80s, 1890s building. Rooftop additions are a little bit of a different thing. <laughs> um, the National Park Service does not recommend rooftop additions for anything less than a three-story building. 
Um, and if you are gonna do a rooftop addition, they um, want you to keep it back from the exterior sides of the building. So that really when you're just walking down the street on the, the public right of way, you don't notice it. So on several of the buildings in, down, in um, Old Town, where we've done tax credit projects, they have rooftop additions. Um, and if they've gone through the tax credit pr process, that's what we hold them to is to hold it back from the sides so that it doesn't over, overwhelm the building. So just a quick example from Manhattan, um, the Duck Walls building um, there in the middle was a Joanne fabric at one point. And then there was a proposal to do a very large rooftop addition um, that was actually bigger, um, almost as tall as the Wareham down the street. And we said, no. <laughs> and so they came back with something smaller um, where it really is just a entrance point to create a rooftop deck. Um, and looking at it in elevation on the drawing, it looks a lot more extreme than it does in a rendering because of the perspective. Um, and so it worked out fine. Um, you can see what it looks like basically today um, as the tap house. You can't see the addition, but you can see the furniture for the rooftop deck. So that is also something that we always encourage people, um, design reviewers to think about, um, is not just the architectural stuff, but also the use, because if that, if that bothered you guys, that might be something to take into consideration. Um, to us, it's just furniture, so we kind of just let it go. But a lot of times, if they're doing rooftop decks, they put um, greenery up there, Christmas lights, um, heaters, you know, all kinds of it, lighting, all kinds of other things. <laughs> um, and this is just a quick reminder about the compatible and differentiated in a different, um, different example, um, commercial storefronts. We see this a lot. Um, which one do you, do you guys think of just a generic downtown commercial building? Which one do you think is compatible but differentiated? Which one of these do you think meets the standards the best? Compatible but differentiated for an existing building? Mm -hmm. Top right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about the pop quiz, but yeah, so the one on the left is what we see a lot in downtown Topeka, which is not my favorite, the dark um, metal with a dark glass, so it really creates sort of a black hole, and the whole purpose of a storefront is so that you can kind of look into the windows as you window shop and go up and down the street, um, and so that closes off the storefront from the store from the street. The bottom um, is a very flat storefront material and it doesn't have the right proportions. So historically, a main street or a downtown commercial building would have a bulkhead, like you can see in the upper right here, large display windows and then a single transom across the top. Um, the one in the bottom middle, of course, has no bulkhead, glass, 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 and then this weird sign board in the top. So just a couple things to finish up with. Um, the National Park Service, as I mentioned, is the federal partner in the CLG program. They have a lot of resources on their website, um, including these things called interpreting the standards. We all know the standards that we just went through are incredibly vague because they have to be. They're for every type of property that's listed on the National Register, including bridges, locomotives, steam shovels, ships, airplanes, all kinds of things. Um, obviously, we mostly deal with buildings, but yeah. So the ITSs are there, the preservation briefs, and the Park Service just redid their website. So if you haven't been there recently, it looks different. <laughs> I haven't gotten used to it yet. But if you look for something called preservation by topic, it is an index to all of those resources. So if you're looking for guidance on storefronts or windows or solar panels or signage, you can just go to S for signage and go down and see what kind of resources they have for interpreting the standards as far as signs go. Um, and I also was one of the things that we talked about with Christina earlier, 
Um, I would love to see the city apply for the grant funding that I have. Um, one of my hats is the CLG coordinator. One of my other hats is the grant manager. So the federal National Park Service, not only are they the federal partner for the CLG program, but they're also um, the main revenue source of the State Preservation Office. Um, so we apply every year for an allocation of funding, and then we are required to pass through at least 10% of that to the CLGs every year. So we do have at least one grant round every year that we put out a solicitation and say, CLGs, please tell me, what would you like to spend money on? And I will give you a grant. Um, applications will be posted soon, probably by the end of the year or early January, and they'll be due in March, and then awards will be announced in May. Those grants just have to be finished up by the end of September, 2024. And there's a possibility of an extension just because the Park Service has been giving us a little bit extra time. But we are looking to do projects that will facilitate the things that you want to see done in your community, things that will help you toward your goals. So for one thing I recommend is becoming a member as a city of the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions, um, because they do offer trainings like webinars and things. And if you're a member, then the Preservation Commission gets free webinars and things. Um, you also get newsletters and all kinds of access to things. But um, they even have a document on their website called How to Avoid Being Sued. <laughs> okay. Um, but they have example design review, um, design guidelines. They have example codes of ethics. They have all kinds of things that can help preservation commissions. They're meant for you guys. Um, but otherwise, CLGs across the state have been really creative with different ways to use the grant funding that I have. Um, obviously, survey is the biggest thing that I recommend because without survey, none of us know where your historic resources are, and we don't know what the newer historic resources are in the community. So I said 1973 is now 50 years old. Do you know where the 1960s good neighborhoods are? Do you know where the good commercial buildings are in town that are from the 60s and early 70s? survey is something that is the mechanism to find those. But outside of survey, you also can do um, hands-on workshops. Um, this is a cemetery um, repair workshop that Douglas County and the city of Lawrence did a couple years ago. Um, Arc City is doing a story map. They did a downtown, they have a downtown commercial district. They did a survey, resurvey of their historic district. Um, and with all of that information that they collected there, they wanted to do like a, a walking tour. And then the more they looked at it, they were like, why don't we just do an app? <laughs> and so that's what they've done. Um, this is a hands-on workshop where they removed the vinyl siding from a house. Um, and they did it as a workshop to teach other people how to do that to their own properties. Um, this is a, a depot in Marysville where um, they did a historic structures report on the building. So if there's a building or a property in the community that like just needs a little bit of assessment, design work, something like that could be a good grant. Um, of course, neighborhood surveys, a preservation plan update. We were talking about that. We think the plan is from Early 2000s? 2001. 2001, okay. So, yeah. So doing some survey. Yeah, but you guys are still ahead of some of the other CLGs, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, whether you do survey first and then do a preservation plan or update the preservation plan and have goals and objectives, laying out where you want to target survey. Um, that could be something to look into. And then mentioning archeology span again, um, I always like to tag that in there because um, archeological resources are subject to development pressures, just like other things. Um, Manhattan a couple of years ago knew that there were going to be a lot of development pressures on properties along Wildcat Creek. And they knew that there were archeological resources there. And so they worked with the university to do an archeological survey, identified where those, those places were, 
listed the ones that were eligible for the National Register, and then were able to, you know, divert development away from places that they knew were going to impact um, cultural resources. Because we don't want to dig up bones, right? <laughs> Do you guys have any questions for me? I had um, a couple notes of things I wanted to make sure I told you before I left too, but any questions? Not, not many really. <laughs> I would just um, try, try to just, you know, staff can help with this, but you know, the distinction of COA versus state law, is it locally listed? Is it listed on the state of the national register? What, what are we reviewing this for? <laughs> um, I think that was probably maybe a little unclear to, to you all and others during the, the whole zoning thing. Like, why are we reviewing this? But it was because of state law. It's an zoning as an action by the government. And so that triggers the state law process. Um, and so things like that, I think could be clearer for you all and, and the public too. Um, but otherwise, you know, motions, votes, agendas, minutes, all that good stuff is good. Um, I was going to mention the two things. The preservation conference, um, the state preservation conference is planned for May 4th and 5th in Independence this coming year. Um, we'll be doing it in person. Um, so if you have any interest in going to that, put that on your calendar. We'll be doing save the dates and things. And there will be scholarships for the CLGs. Um, and then also, um, I saw Kathy Morgan earlier today and was talking to her about a project, and she had not heard about the changes to the state tax credit that happened this last year, um, and thought that you guys may need an update on that as well. So some legislation this last summer, um, the legislation legislator, legislature passed sort of this big bill that had a bunch of different tax credits in there, some were for housing or daycares or all kinds of things, but in that they upped our historic tax credit, state historic tax credit, um, based on population. So it doesn't really impact Wichita because you guys have the biggest population. But for communities of smaller sizes, if you have a community under 9,500 population, they get a 40% tax credit now. And if it's between 9,500 and 50,000, it's a 30% tax credit everyone else gets 25%, just like we, we've had for the last um, 20 years. Um, but there's also a 10% tax credit for any commercial building over 50 years old. So if it's not historic, or even if it is historic, but you don't want to do the historic tax credits and get the 25%, you can just claim the 10% on your taxes. And then there's a tax credit for fire suppression systems. Um, so if you're doing a housing development or something like that, and you have to put in fire suppression systems, you get a 10% tax credit on that. And then there is, no, this seems like a lot, sorry. Um, lastly, there's, there's a credit for banks that loan to rehabilitation projects. So usually they have to pay taxes on the interest that they earn on those loans. And the new, the new thing is, is that they only have to pay half of that tax if they loan to a historic rehab project. So there's some good stuff going on. Um, with the historic, no, no, it's an either or. Basically, it's if you don't want to do the paperwork <laughs> or you don't want to mess with meeting the standards, which is not ideal from our standpoint, but. It was it was signed July 1st, so I think it goes back to July 1st, but not before that. Yeah. You guys have any questions for me? I guess I put my contact information up there if you guys need to reach me. What? Tell me what that Enviro thing was you had at the first. Environs? Okay. So the, the state preservation law used to have a 500-foot um, circle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And they took that away in 2013. Yeah. yeah. Depending on your perspective, yeah. <laughs> But there are other communities that have that at the local level. So that, like Kansas City has a local environs. I think it's 250 feet. I will stress that it's for it's for low, you know, because it's a it was be through your ordinance, it would have to impact locally listed properties. And that is something I brought up to Christina. Not that I'm expecting it, but I've been I've been saying this for like 10 years because I don't want you guys to be taken by surprise if this happens. But if the state law goes away, your local ordinance, the COA process only applies to locally listed properties. It does not apply to properties that are on the state and the national register. So to protect the historic properties in your community, you want them to be on the local register. That being said, it's hard to encourage people to list their properties on the local register because there's no tax credits, grants, that's it, things to entice them. If that's the case, if that's the case, good. My counterpoint to that is why are you not doing a COA review then on every one of them? <laughs> Make sure. Yeah. It, I'm gonna turn to the attorney. <laughs> My understanding is that, yeah, it has to do with like, um, due process and things like that. You can't you you can't impose regulations on people, you know, without them knowing what they're getting themselves into. So, for example, yeah, we don't we don't want to ever put something on the local register automatically just because it's on the state or the national register because it is a it is a different regulation. It's a different law that they would be subject to, and so it needs to be their choice to to put it on the local register. Uh, some are triple listed, but there are some that are just on, I believe the Garvey Center, which is the latest nomination. I don't think that one is triple listed. I think it's just the National Register. Well, I'm just going to put this out here because <laughs> Again, Kansas being special with our state law, I think it's for, since the 1980s, it's been like the, the state has the carrots and the sticks. And we at the local level are just here to kind of facilitate. And that's, that's a nice position to be in. None of the other states do it that way. If you go to South Carolina, New Orleans, you know, Boston, their preservation commission has all the power, all the control. The state preservation office does nothing except for administer the national register and the tax credit programs. They do not do any kind of design review at the local level. So Kansas is very different in that way. And I think it has meant that the local preservation programs have not developed fully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because if you're in Charleston and you really care about your historic house, you will put it on the local register. You will make it subject to local design review because you want to protect it. You might get a property tax rebate or something like that, but putting it on the state or the national register is just nice. It doesn't come, they don't have a state tax credit. They don't, they don't have any you know, other incentives. Kansas is great that we have the state tax credit, but it means that most people go for state and national register listing and don't want it to be on the local register because they don't want the added re regulation. I think there's a local, did you say 
Christina, there's a local. Yeah, we have a revolving loan program where, you know, which can be forgiven if you meet a certain income threshold, but I haven't seen it utilized here. I've, heated, I've seen a couple of people who are eligible for it, but they just, they're like, it's a loan. It's not a grant, you know, mm -hmm. so. And I think. Change that. I think neighborhood revitalization, I think, might apply to most, if not all of them. I'm not sure how you guys rate. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that is something that, I mean, CLGs in general struggle with is how do we get people to list their properties on the local register without having a carrot to encourage that. Um, and we just have all the sticks. <laughs> so, but I, I do, I just want to caution because not that I think it's going to happen, but it could happen. A legislator this next year could, you know, propose a bill and the state law could go away. And then how would you protect your historic resources? Just like the environs went away with just in one legislative session. Yeah. So, any other questions? All right, generate some ideas for money because I have money that I have to give away. Thank you so much. Can we have a motion to adjourn? May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I, uh, uh, Elena I seconds. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.